Happy New Year, first of all, to everyone who's joining us tonight. And um, thanks very much for taking the time. I still, We still have a number of people that are joining as participants, so um, which is terrific. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and get started just to be on time and in respect for Dr. Turner's time tonight. And of course, everyone else as we're making our way back into our lives this early in the year. And I do wanna make sure that there's plenty of time for people to be able to ask um, questions and get them answered today, because I suspect that we will have a fair few number. So with that, I wanna highlight that this is our first community lecture of 2022, sponsored by the UCI Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center. Today, we're gonna to hear from Dr. Lee Turner, who is a relatively new recruit just in the last six months to UCI. We were so excited to support his recruitment to public health here because he, works in this very critical area that has to do with how do we evaluate ethics and policy when it comes to things like regenerative medicine and cell therapeutics. And that is in fact the title of his talk tonight, The American Stem Cell Cell, Ethics, Advertising and Direct Consumer Stem Cell Clinics. Um, with that, in just a moment, we're gonna come to Dr. Turner's, le Turner's lecture. But first, of course, I want to not just welcome everyone who's joining us, but really um, give some shout outs and some thanks to Judy Beck, who's our Director of Communications, to the phenomenal people at UCI Media who have helped us all along in putting on these events. Um, before COVID and certainly that much more critically after COVID, Will Alvarez and Kyle Good, and um, Dr. Brian Cummings, who has been um, our Stem Cell Research Center community outreach chair since the inception of this idea to do these sorts of public outreach events. Um, again, how can you help? Well, we would love to be able to welcome you back in person. I think we're all kind of mentally struggling with not being able to do that right now. I certainly was extremely disappointed, but you can still participate. You can sign up for our newsletter, follow us on Facebook, visit our websites. Um, and of course, philanthropy is very, very important um, to the university as a whole and certainly to the, temp to the stem cell center. So please do consider um, working with us um, or Amber Harness from the advancement office to help us in any way that you can. I wanna point you to just a couple of things for orientation. Um, the first is that our 2021 year in review is up and live on our website. It has some really terrific stories pointing back over particular milestones um, and accomplishments that we've had over the last year. I encourage everybody to drop in and just take a look at those stories. We would love it if you did, because we're all excited about um, the sorts of things that we have going on here and how much progress that we have made despite COVID. That said, um, I have some bad news as well. Uh, at the end of this month is our annual stem cell um, symposium, which for the second year in a row, we made the very tough decision last week. We are going to have to take fully virtual and online. Of course, this is in deference because the university is not offering in-person instruction through the end of the month, so limiting the number of folks that are on campus. We had hoped um, and we were really excited to have Dr. Anthony Atala join us for um, our evening public lecture, but in deference to where he is at Wake Forest, which is more severely affected um, than we happen to be in this area right now in general by COVID, and also just because of where we are and the uncertainty of this current surge of the pandemic, we're gonna delay that lecture we are not gonna go virtual, we're gonna delay it and we're working to schedule another date. I am remaining hopeful that that is gonna be possible this year and um, Judy and our team will be reaching out ev to everyone to keep you updated and in the loop. That said, um, just a couple of words on format. As always, um, because of the virtual format here, we're gonna let Dr. Turner please to complete his presentation. Um, and at the end, there'll be plenty of time for questions. You can put questions into the question and answer box, the Q&A box. I'll answer those as they come in if possible, or I will compile them to be able to um, ask them in a moderated session at the end. And if there should be questions that come in um, via any other means, by the chat box or, or alternatives, we'll be monitoring those as, well, those as well, and we'll be sure to get them asked. With that, um, it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Turner this evening. Again, we are so excited to have him here at UCI, and I hope everyone is looking forward to his presentation as much as I am. Please, Lee, go ahead. Uh, let me start by uh, thanking you, Dr. Anderson, uh, for the introduction uh, and for your colleagues as well for helping organize this event. 
Um, and also, as you said, I'm a recent arrival here. And uh, so I'd also like to say thank you, uh, not just for the chance to participate in tonight's presentation, but also to join you and your colleagues here at UCI. It's been a busy stretch and I'm um, really glad to be here. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, and also for those of you who are uh, participating in tonight's event, uh, watching, listening, uh, thanks so much for deciding to uh, spend part of your evening uh, participating in this event. This was supposed to be a hybrid gathering and uh, once again, we're back online. I know that uh, you know, the, the recent period feels like a setback for everyone. So uh, hopefully we all get through this and move on to better days fairly soon. So uh, my presentation, I am gonna focus on um, you know, businesses, clinics here in the United States that are, that are selling and administering unlicensed, unproven stem cell interventions. I'm gonna provide a little bit of context for that um, in just a little bit. Um, we're going to provide some historical data, also some hopefully more contemporary data, but um, I also wanted to just have a very brief disclosure statement. I know that the literature on this is that people quickly click on their disclosure, disclosure slide and then kind of blast off to the rest of it. I'm probably going to do the same here, but just to highlight a few details, um, there are a couple of cases I'm involved in, one a pro bono case, uh, this is a civil suit compensated uh, in a criminal case, although that funding will be uh, channeling back to UCI. Um, the details haven't been worked out yet, but it's a conversation I've had with my dean. I'm a member of a couple of societies, uh, International Society for Stem Cell Research and International Society for Cell and Gene Therapy, as well as on their committees. And I'm a, a PI on a, on a research project that's been funded, uh, very generously funded by Pew Charitable Trust. So I'm not going to talk about um, any of the cases that I'm involved in in any specific kind of way. And I don't even know that all of these should be listed as, as potential conflicts of interest or information to disclose, but uh, I, I don't think it hurts to share this information and um, hopefully it's not uh, influencing in any way of my remarks this evening. Um, so moving on to the, to the focus of the presentation itself, um, there's a kind of a stock way of approaching this topic that I think was really quite dominant several years ago. And that is that, you know, when discussing individuals pursuing stem cell interventions that aren't really backed with meaningful evidence of, uh, of safety and efficacy. You know, the assumption was often that, that there was a journey taking place and individuals, if we were here in the United States, for example, that if someone was seeking a, a purported stem cell treatment that really didn't have an awful lot of evidence behind it, that those individuals presumably would go somewhere else. They must go somewhere else. And there is an early body of peer-reviewed scholarship uh, also an early body of investigative reporting on the subject that, uh, you know, what it found was that these journeys, these cross-border journeys were taking place where Americans were going to other countries such as China, India, Mexico, Russia, Ukraine, Panama. And if you were to look at scholarship emerging out of Canada, you'd see kind of a, a similar uh, narrative there, uh, New Zealand, Australia, that, you know, there were journeys elsewhere. And often the explanation was that individuals were leaving uh, well-regulated marketplace with, uh, you know, sort of comprehensive, robust regulations with effective, uh, well-resourced regulatory bodies and going to jurisdictions where there weren't laws on the books, so nothing really relevant and applicable to stem cell products, or maybe there were laws, but they had gaping holes. There was some literature on that time on, on the, the patchwork of laws and gaps in laws. Uh, and then there were also some works suggesting that, uh, you know, lack of regular, uh, lack of oversight of businesses selling these interventions, maybe it was because of institutional corruption, um, maybe it was because of inadequate resources on the part of regulatory bodies, there might be a number of factors, but this was something taking place elsewhere. Um, the piece to the, to the right of this screen by Gareth Cook, um, this is an article that came out in 2004 about, uh, you know, parents looking for stem cell interventions for their children. This was um, one component of a series that ended up winning a, a Pulitzer Prize. Um, but um, Gareth Cook focused on part of his series focused on travel to uh, clinics in, in China. Uh, and this was a kind of, as I said, a common narrative at the time. Now, behind the scenes, not really spotted at that time, um, you know, between 2002, 2009, around that period, there actually were some businesses here in the United States that uh, were involved in advertising stem cell products that, that uh, weren't FDA approved, weren't standard of care in any kind of way. And in fact, there were some pretty rigorous responses on, on the uh, part of regulatory bodies, uh, you know, criminal charges, for example, being filed against individuals involved in one business. Um, Chris Christie, the former governor of New Jersey was involved. He was the attorney, relevant attorney uh, in a case that was brought against two individuals um, in the New Jersey area for marketing purported stem cell treatments to people with ALS. So there was this activity, but there was also a swift response. Um, but so we're getting 
the beginning of a somewhat different narrative, not so much of tourism or travel elsewhere, but some activity taking place in the United States. And that's going to be my focus tonight. Um, so I did a piece, uh, I got really interested in this emerging marketplace um, in, in the United States. So that, you know, looking at businesses, taking advantage of the rhetoric of stem cell treatments and therapies, not kind of doing the very difficult preclinical and clinical work to actually bring products to market. And I uh, began following this around 2012. And um, in 2016, had a co-authored piece that came out in Cell Stem Cell with the co-author, Paul Knopfler, uh, who's also in the UC system at University of California at Davis. And um, we, you know, we ended up finding um, a, 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 a quite strikingly large marketplace here in the United States, not just a handful of businesses sprinkled across the country, but 351 businesses that were operating 570 clinics. Now that seemed you know, pretty jaw dropping at the time. And I'm going to, to discuss some data in a few minutes that really kind of brings a sense of the, you know, a much larger marketplace that's now existing and operating here in the United, United States today. Um, I think it's important, you know, I, this is not meant to be a kind of a balanced presentation where I kind of, you know, talk about the pros of going to businesses of this kind or the merits of, of going to these places, mostly because I think that these are interventions, these are procedures that are highly problematic uh, for, you know, in terms of patient safety, in terms of public health. Um, I'm going to soon get into a lot of the details, but I do think it's important, you know, without kind of condoning businesses that are involved in this activity, I think it's important to sort of think about it from a patient's perspective and try and understand why might individuals be drawn to businesses and certainly to their marketing claims, um, you know, businesses that are making stem cell cl claims that they have treatments or therapies for, um, you know, a litany of, of uh, illnesses, injuries, other kinds of indications. Well, I think some of these are fairly obvious, which is that, you know, we are all uh, vulnerable uh, mortal beings who who have injuries from time to time, uh, who end up experiencing illness, who die, um, and this you know vulnerability is a part of the human condition. And so, you know, some of us we may be feeling healthy at the moment, but I think we can feel confident that that's going to change at some point in our lives. And some people may have had quite serious illnesses before this evening. So it's not surprisingly, you know, when we have particularly difficult periods of life like this, whether it's being faced with a, a life-threatening disease, a life-altering disease or injury, uh, a challenging degenerative disease, uh, chronic conditions that come with a lot of pain and suffering that people, you know, look for therapeutic relief. And now, uh, you know, in 2022, as it's been the case for quite some time now, it's common to kind of go on the internet, look for something that's out there. And so I'm going to get to that in a second, but that's, I think, part of this experience as well. There's also been uh, you know, some quite powerful influential works in, in peer-reviewed scholarship pointing out that stem cell research has been one of these areas where you can find you know, a lot of sober, careful, cautious peer-reviewed studies, but also a fair degree of hyperbole. Sometimes that's coming from businesses, sometimes it's coming from academic institutions, sometimes it's coming from PIs of studies. It can come from many different sources, and there's been good work by Tim Coffield and others on the, you know, the hype pipeline. Uh, that's one way of imagining it. But this is where we have rhetoric that kind of goes beyond available evidence, gets into this promotional territory and all, creates a lot of, um, you know, fluff and froth and hype around stem cells, which I think has, a, has an effect on public understanding to the extent to which I think it's fair to suspect that for many individuals, it's actually quite difficult, quite challenging to make distinctions between evidence-based uh, stem cell therapies, like, you know, FDA approved ones or ones that have become standard of care from stem cell interventions that aren't uh, or are not yet backed by convincing credible evidence of safety and efficacy. I think that's a, a difficult distinction in some cases for physicians and other healthcare providers to make, but particularly a bit difficult, difficult for, for patients uh, and sometimes at crises in their life. There's also been, uh, you know, the emergence of an ethos or an ethic of patient autonomy where people, you know, want to make choices for themselves, want to make individual decisions for themselves, don't want to just passively sit and wait to be told what to do by their clinician, but to play a more engaged kind of role. And again, that may involve uh, taking advantage of the internet, going online, looking around for opportunities and make, making a decision to, to go to a particular place that's offering something that seems compelling um, and, and helpful. And the other part that I would add, you know, beyond the emergence of the internet and online advertising is that it's not just that there's a lot of advertising out there that patients can tap into, but there's an extraordinary amount of misrepresentations that are used to sell these purported stem cell products. And I think that's the kind of, you know, a core motif when you look at scholarship in this area, whether it's by sociologists, anthropologists, 
uh, scholars from other fields in, in health studies, legal studies. Again and again, you know, when you look at empirical work and normative analysis, what you find is the a, an understanding of the extent to which misrepresent, mis, misrepresentations, misleading advertising really play an important role in this marketplace. So it's not that people are necessarily getting a fair account of what they're interested in, in, in purchasing or having as an intervention, but that often there, there's this kind of marketing pitches that lure people in, uh, in part by underestimating risks and exaggerating benefits. And I think that's problematic for many reasons, and I'll, I'll get to that. Um, but that's a little bit in terms of, you know, what do we make or what can we make of this phenomenon? I think it's multi-layered. There's not a single factor explaining it. Uh, there's a lot going on here. And some of the points that I mentioned here probably just scratch the surface. Again, I think it's important to just pause for a second and understand that, that uh, you know, there are some stem, some stem cell-based interventions that have become standard of care. They're, they're backed by years or decades of safety and efficacy data. There are many clinical trials. For many of us who are participating in tonight's event, uh, you know, if we know of someone who's had a stem cell transplant, it may be a family member or a friend who's had a bone marrow stem cell transplant or a peripheral blood stem cell transplant. And if that's the case, it's, you know, in all likelihood, it's been for a cancer of the blood or maybe a select number of immunological conditions. But, you know, there are some illnesses that are effectively treated uh, through stem cell transplants. There are also um, some stem cell products, some cell-based products that, that in fact are FDA approved. So I definitely want to make sure that I, part of what I'm conveying is that, you know, there are some evidence-based stem cell interventions. I don't want to in any way suggest that there's strictly this kind of problematic marketplace of direct-to-consumer activity and it's all pseudoscience or stem cell quackery. There are evidence-based stem cell interventions and there are, in some cases, FDA approved stem cell products. And I think in part that contributes to the difficulties that individuals have because, you know, when you have these stem cell products, but then you also have a lot of misleading misrepresentations, again, it's very difficult to figure out, you know, where are these lines? Where are these distinctions? There's nothing really that's self-evident about it. Um, and uh, part of what I'm going to get at is that we're going to talk more about some of the businesses that are operating here in the United States. They work much like uh, businesses in other countries that sell purported stem cell products. There's a kind of a repertoire of advertising pitches that businesses will use. Um, and uh, Doug Sipp and, and colleagues in a, in a, a piece um, that came out uh, back in 2017, I think it came up with this very evocative phrase uh, that, that, that businesses operating in this space use various tokens of legitimacy. And these are claims that are used to make what a business is doing seem uh, credible, evidence-based, scientific, legal. And so these are all very reassuring kinds of statements that when businesses go on, uh, when, it, when patients, for example, go online, they see a lot of material that, that uh, seems credible and, and trustworthy and legitimate. So some of the tokens of legitimacy that, that they noted in this piece were things like, you know, when businesses go to websites of businesses that are marketing purported stem cell treatments, there can be scientific seeming marketing statements. So, so sometimes you'll have, for example, misleading claims, but then woven into it will be material cut and paste from the National Institutes of Health website. So it's, you know, it's sort of uh, something you might find at any academic medical center or, or um, other kind of credible source. Sometimes, and this is something that, that for citrus that many academic institutions have to deal with, you'll have businesses that have done no preclinical research, no studies of any kind, uh, no clinical trials of any kind, no published peer-reviewed reports of any kind. But what they'll do is they'll take peer-reviewed scholarship and, and again, they'll use that to lend credibility, legitimacy to whatever they're advertising. And they'll do that by referring to studies, maybe done on mice or rats or other animal models and use it to make it seem as though, and this is why we're kind of offering this intervention today. Uh, even though the researchers themselves are far from having a product that they think of as being ready to market. It's not something that they're selling yet, but it's the, it's a way of kind of not just using, but abusing scientific research to make it seem as though interventions are, are ready for prime time today or ready to be sold today. Uh, for those of you who've spent any time on, on um, company websites operating in this space, it's also very common to find um, testimonials, whether they're, they're brief promotional narratives or whether they're videos that are then posted to YouTube. But you can find testimonials that come from uh, celebrities, athletes, athletes who are celebrities, 
prior patients that tend to offer before and after stories, a before story of illness and suffering and difficulties in life caused by an illness or an injury, and then the after of having a stem cell procedure and benefiting from it and, and being able to go out and play tennis again or get involved in activities. So it's these kind of transformative narratives suggesting that it's being administered stem cells that has really made a difference in the lives of these individuals. And these are promotional narratives that have an, a, an emotional aspect to them. They're very powerful. They're very compelling. And these play a role, again, in kind of drawing people to these businesses, even though they may be nothing more than anecdotes. There's not really anything scientific behind them, uh, but they're compelling. And then uh, on this slide, you can see a, a variety of other um, sort of arrows in the quiver or techniques businesses can use uh, coming up with what are often little more than junk studies and posting clinicaltrials.gov. So all of a sudden, an NIH-run government platform is then used as a marketing platform for, for a business, uh, seeking IRB approval, um, going out and maybe finding a for-profit IRB that looks a bit like a rubber stamp operation and not going through FDA review, not getting FDA clearance, but finding a, an IRB getting approval, even though that's not supposed to be enough uh, for a study. Uh, and then there's also been the emergence of predatory journals, uh, or what's sometimes known as junk science, where you can take a case report or a case series, there's not really meaningful peer review, get an article and then use that to make it seem as though a particular business is an active participant in the world of credible research. And there are other moves that businesses of this kind make. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the larger problem here is that um, these businesses enter the marketplace, engage in, in what's often described as direct-to-consumer activity, uh, and they'll claim that their product doesn't need FDA approval. It doesn't need pre-marketing authorization. And in fact, they, that's, that's wrong. That's not the case. But they haven't conducted preclinical research. They haven't conducted clinical research. They do need FDA approval. They say that's not the case. Uh, and in part, what's going on here is that, you know, there's actually often very little in the way of meaningful regulatory response. When there are regulatory responses, it's often in the form of a letter, a warning letter, an untitled letter, which is not necessarily all that consequential. Criminal charges are rare. Loss of right licensure is rare. Financial penalties are rare. And so I think part of what we have here is a, a regulatory framework where it's just a little too easy to game, where, where you can make a lot of money if you don't have a product that needs pre that, 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 that has not obtained pre-marketing authorization from the FDA, which can take a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort, and just kind of hop into the marketplace by claiming to have a product that doesn't need FDA approval, even though it takes little familiarity with regulations to know that that's not the case. Um, so this is a... Um, a more recent study, I mentioned that earlier 2016 one, and I'm going to try and provide a little bit of detail in terms of the, the nuts and bolts of the contemporary state of this marketplace. You know, what can we find when we do a survey of the landscape here in the United States? What kind of businesses do we find? What kind of clinics? And it is really kind of quite striking. So if you think about that earlier study, you know, again, 351 businesses, 570 clinics, this latest study, uh, which came out um, this summer, uh, it was in June, as I recall. Uh, the data set itself went to March 2021. And uh, in this case, I ended up finding 1,480 businesses operating 2,754 clinics. So, I mean, I think a kind of a quick shorthand just to sort of remember this is, you know, it's around 1,500 businesses that are now operating in this marketplace and they are operating close to 3,000 clinics. So in a way it's kind of, you know, for every business there, there are two clinics. So this is a pretty large marketplace and we're no longer talking about uh, individuals in the United States, you know, they don't have to go to Thailand or Panama or somewhere else. It may be that, uh, you know, they don't have to get on a plane. They don't even necessarily need to get in a car and go somewhere. These businesses can be found all over the place. It's really become a very large scale domestic marketplace. Um, just a second here. Um, there we go. So a couple of details about these are businesses. So just to be clear in terms of the data that I, that I share next, I'm talking about businesses that do not have FDA approval for whatever they're advertising. There's no evidence that they've got FDA cleared uh, investigation of new drug applications. What they're advertising falls outside uh, current standard of care. I know that's a topic, that need, a phrase that needs to be unpacked, but I'm gonna use it in a kind of a quick and cursory way here. And in general, we're talking about interventions that are, are not backed by convincing safety and efficacy data from, from you know, uh, carefully designed, uh, capably conducted controlled clinical trials. So just a bit of detail, you know, what are we talking about here? What can we find today uh, in 2021, 2022 here in the United States? Well, there are some states, California included, that have um, 
you know, over 300 clinics operating in a single state. So California's got 347, Florida uh, found 333, Texas found 310. So that's an awful lot of uh, clinics now operating in this space. So I think of those as being on the, the top end in terms of number of clinics. There are also uh, other states, you know, Arizona, New Jersey, New York, Colorado, as you can see among them, that are kind of in a different tier where they've got an awful lot of these clinics, they've got over 100 but they're not in that 300 category. And then there are about eight states right now that have um, in excess of 50 clinics operating. And then if you look uh, you know, at this table, what you can see is basically all across the United States, whatever state we're talking about, including uh, in the District of Columbia, you can find uh, cl clinics of some kind operating in these places, marketing purported stem cell treatments. So you can find uh, you know, operating at scale in some places, um, the three that I mentioned in green in particular, and you can find, you know, kind of modest or moderate amounts elsewhere. But this is not just a story of one or two states. It's really a story of the United States uh, in, in all of its territories. Um, so it's widespread right now. And I think from a regulatory perspective, it's quite challenging. We're not just talking about a couple of businesses that are regulatory outliers. We're talking about a, uh, you know, a large and it looks to me still expanding marketplace. What do these businesses advertise? What is it that they sell when they're marketing stem cell treatments? Well, in terms of the products that they're advertising, there's a lot that's out there. Um, so some don't get into any details at all about the, the stem cell treatments that they'll mention, they'll, they'll refer to stem cell treatments or stem cell therapies, but they don't kind of offer any specifics about what they're advertising. Um, the most dominant claim is businesses that will advertise autologous, so that's from a person and then back into that person. Um, bone marrow aspirate with um, you know, 671 businesses uh, using that as the product that they advertise. Uh, the next most common um, is it's businesses that are using autologous adipose derived stem cell products. So that's taking it from fat, processing it in some way, um, using enzymatic, enzymatic digestion or ultrasonic cavitation or other means to break apart the fat, process that product and then put it back into a person. Those are the two that maybe get discussed the most when talking about the U.S. direct-to-consumer marketplace for stem cell products. But there's actually a third category that's maybe not quite as easy to spot. Uh, and that's uh, what I've kind of come to think of as the birth, birth tissue-derived products. And so that, these are businesses that when you look at their marketing claims, they will refer to placenta-derived stem cell products or um, uh, amniotic-derived stem cell products. Um, or umbilical cord derived stem cell products. And, you know, if you look at, at kind of each of them and don't collect them, they may not kind of pop out at you. Um, but when you kind of add them all together, you begin to realize that this is actually a pretty sizable part of the US marketplace. And, you know, a lot of this activity, it's basically podiatrists or chiropractors or, or other clinics that are, that are ordering supplies from a supplier or manufacturer of some kind. It's shipped to that facility, and then that's what's, what's, that's what's administered to individuals. And the FDA, uh, in, in recent years, has kind of stepped up its game, stepped up its, its activity, issuing a number of warning letters and untitled letters to businesses that are, that are involved in this sort of activity. But the regulatory response, as you can see, doesn't cl come close to the number of businesses that are actually operating in this space. The 2016 study didn't see any businesses advertising exosomes. We can get into more detail about that later if some of you are interested. But, uh, you know, 2021, uh, it was possible to find 99, so almost 100 businesses that, that uh, are now advertising stem cell derived exosome products. And the FDA has uh, issued a kind of consumer alert, which mentions not just stem cell and regenerative medicine products, but also exosome products is something that, that patients and citizens need to be wary of and understand that they're not FDA approved for any of the indications that businesses are, are advertising them for. Um, in terms of the kinds of um, claims that businesses make, you know, what do they claim to treat? Um, there, you can look at that disease by disease and um, the work that I've been involved in, if you look at the papers themselves, there's quite a bit of detail there about the specific diseases and injuries, but you can also look at it in terms of broader categories. And the most dominant kinds of marketing representations you can find made by the businesses in this space, it's often you know, vague, uh, rather diffuse claims about treating pain, relieving pain, managing pain. Um, you can also find uh, an awful lot of businesses, as you can see, close to 700 of them that uh, are operating in the orthopedic space, um, claiming to treat orthopedic diseases and injuries. A lot of claims about sports medicine. And then after that, you can find uh, um, you know, over 100 businesses that will claim to treat uh, various you know, neurological diseases and injuries. And so this would include, for example, um, you know, individuals with ALS, Parkinson's disease, um, 
traumatic brain injury. You can kind of go on from there. Immunological, again, over 100 businesses operating in this space, um, 95 of them marketing in, 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 you know, sort of conditions, diseases related to um, diseases, injuries of, of the lung uh, respiratory system. So, you know, when you look at all of this, uh, you know, in terms of the level of evidence, the current state of stem cell research, I wouldn't say that it's sort of one size fits all. We can talk about this in a singular kind of way, but there are certainly spaces in this marketplace, neurological, for example, where I think we can really see this really profound gap between the current state of stem cell research, which, you know, may be encouraging, for example, when it comes to developing stem cell therapies for treatment of individuals with ALS. But I don't think we're at a point, we still don't have any FDA approved stem cell products for treating individuals with ALS. And I, I would also say that when it comes to clinical research, there's still you know, quite a long ways to go. It's really premature to be marketing these products. They're certainly can't be described as current standard of care by any means. And that's true in many of these other categories as well. The ortho space maybe deserves its own conversation. And if we have time, we can kind of, you know, come back and talk about that space. But I think this is also problematic as well. And in fact, some of the case reports looking at complications and injuries in this, in this marketplace, uh, they are occurring in that, in that ortho category, pain management category. So I don't think we should think that, oh, that's uh, an area that kind of gets to be completely off the hook. It's safe. Those stem cell products work. I think it's, again, premature to be making those claims. Now, what about the businesses themselves? Um, you know, how do they how do they brand themselves? How do they advertise themselves? How do they package themselves to prospective clients, to patients? Well, um, you know, we often use the language of referring to businesses operating this space as stem cell clinics. But if you actually look at how businesses frame themselves and position themselves, you you can find businesses that kind of use that as a brand, use it as a marketing hook. There are. Um, you know, of the 1,480 businesses that I was able to find, there are 335 of them that do package themselves as stem cell clinics or stem cell and regenerative medicine clinics. But there's actually an awful lot of activity occurring in this space that it's not really self-defined stem cell clinics. It's more clinics, businesses of some kind that advertise stem cell treatments, but it's often as a kind of a sideline or as part of a... Um, part of an array of, of other kinds of interventions. So you can find, as you can see from some of the numbers at the top of this slide, you, know, you can find an awful lot of businesses that brand package themselves as pain clinics, pain management clinics that are operating this space, a lot of ortho clinics, um, a lot of integrative medicine clinics, uh, podiatrists, chiropractors. You can also find spine clinics, laser clinics, vein clinics, um, clinics that focus on treating erectile dysfunction, um, cosmetic clinics, medical spas, health spas. So I think what that does is it starts to get a sense of there are a lot of kind of different kinds of business entities operating this space. Some of them are focused primarily or exclusively on advertising purported stem cell treatments. Others, it may be a fairly mainstream run-of-the-mill orthopedic practice that has stem cells as a bit of a sideline. There can also be a lot of sort of, you know, weird and wacky things going on there, like the podiatrist who offers purported stem cell treatments for a whole litany of indications and maybe has a, you know, a nurse come in uh, once a week to do a bunch of procedures and that, that that's kind of that business's business model. Um, so that's a little bit in terms of sort of some of the nuts and bolts, you know, where are we today with this marketplace? There are a lot of methodological details that I could get into about, you know, how do you do research like this? Um, and, you know, how do you look for these businesses and how do you analyze them? And I'm happy to discuss that a bit later on. But I want to focus now more on not just sort of the empirical findings, you know, what can you find when you try and study this marketplace, but also why does it matter? Why should we, we can be concerned about the emergence of a marketplace of businesses that are involved in direct consumer advertising, but have not uh, generated the preclinical data, the safety and efficacy data needed to bring products to market, either as standard of care, uh, you know, kind of gradually accumulating evidence or as FDA approved products. Um, and one reason I want to suggest this is really, you know, quite concerning is that when you bring products into the marketplace and start putting them into human beings and, you know, very carefully done preclinical research hasn't taken place, very carefully conducted um, you know, incremental clinical trials have not taken place is that, you know, you can not just have really serious injuries happening to patients, but you can also have one that, that it's not that shocking that they're taking place because the products haven't been carefully tested. There's not really a meaningful notion of dose. There's been no kind of careful review of what can be done to reduce risk, to manage risk. Um, and so this is an example of, of one of many case series and case reports where you can find, uh, in this case, it's a fairly well-known business in Florida that became subject to a permanent injunction by the FDA. 
Uh, it's been the subject of a lot of invest investigative reporting, U.S. Stem Cell Clinic in Florida. It also became the focus of this New England Medicine article. Uh, a number of women went there to, they were suffering from vision impairment of some kind. They went to this clinic to have uh, what they thought of as a stem cell treatment that would help them see better. And they ended up being effectively blinded or suffering severe vision loss. Now, this is maybe the most, you know, well-known case series, uh, case, case report describing major ad adverse events, serious complications after having a purported stem cell procedure, but it's really kind of the tip of the iceberg. There are a lot of other reports that are, that are out there as well. Um, now, you know, in terms of harms to individuals, the risks that, that are connected to this kind of activity, some of it has to do with the stem cell products themselves not being carefully te tested. Uh, not having, you know, some sort of, you know, meaningful body of evidence around safety and efficacy and also a favorable uh, benefit risk ratio. Part of this is that this appears to be a marketplace where there are an awful lot of individuals who seem to be, you know, sort of well outside the boundaries of any meaningful notion of training and expertise. And so there's kind of an interesting discrepancy. This is some work that I've done with um, uh, Subin Master and colleagues at the Mayo Clinic. And, and what we ended up finding was that the ortho space uh, is a little bit different where there, you know, you can find some activity of maybe a, a stem cell intervention that's being offered and advertised that, that has some significant problems when it comes to evidence. But at least the individuals involved in this space have a background as orthopedic surgeons. But at many other clinics, uh, that kind of sort of ballpark relevant expertise isn't present. And so I think we need to think about this as another risk in this space, that it's the products that are being administered, you know, where they're being administered, how they're being administered, not meaningful notion of dose, not meaningful understanding of why you might use one stem cell product than another, but also just an awful lot of individuals who just aren't bringing any relevant training or expertise. And so I think of it as kind of a, a multiplier effect, risks upon risks uh, that can lead to serious complications. Um, there's all, there are also documented instances where the suppliers, the manufacturers uh, have played an important role in what end up becoming serious harms to, to patients, to individuals receiving stem cell products. So this is a piece that came out last year. Um, it's in JAMA Network Open, as you can see, and it's a report of um, 20 patients who were in several different states, all of whom thought that they were getting stem cell treatments. These were umbilical cord uh, derived products that were advertised as stem cell therapies. And these were products that in fact were bacterially, bacterially contaminated. And so it looks, you know, the, the study found that the contamination appeared to take place at the manufacturer, at the supplier. That supplier then distributed its products to a variety of clinics in a number of different states. Individuals went in thinking that they were going to be helped and ended up suffering, uh, you know, serious infections, serious complications requiring hospitalization, uh, treatment, and a variety of complications. So again, it's not just the individual procedure. It's not just this some, sometimes an un undertrained or unqualified individual. It can also be a problematic larger marketplace where the distributors, the suppliers themselves, problems are taking place at those facilities. And again, when you have products that have not gone through, you know, careful screening mechanisms, quality assurance mechanisms, the careful data gathering that goes on to actually bring a product to market, you just have someone who sh sh sets up shop as a supplier of stem cell products. It's again, not really shocking that you're going to have some contaminated products circulating in the marketplace. And that's true of exosome products as well. Um, work by... Um, uh, Liz Richardson uh, and, and colleagues at, uh, at Pew, uh, Pew Charitable Trust, as, as I mentioned, is funding some of the work that I'm doing. They've kind of done this uh, overview looking at adverse events, and they found a lot of case reports, a lot of case series documenting adverse events that are associated with the administration of unproven stem cell and regenerative medicine products. And they also point out that that you know, most of the reports that we can find out there, they're not, they're not produced by individuals who are involved in marketing these procedures. They're not produced by individuals involved in administering these procedures. It's, it's more the clinicians who have to clean up the mess and end up treating individuals with serious complications. Now that's not a particularly effective uh, means of reporting adverse events. And so there's probably substantial under-reporting of adverse events and complications occurring in this marketplace. I, man I mentioned this just to point out that some of the marketing rhetoric suggests that look, you know, uh, a stem cell procedure at these facilities, maybe it's not gonna benefit you, but there's really no downside. There's nothing that can go wrong. Uh, you know, there's no risk of immunological reaction or any kind of complication. And that's just not true. 
there are there are documented you know, extremely serious complications that have occurred that can occur, and this is something that patients need to think about and be wary about when they're going you know when they're if they're thinking about going to a business that's marketing a stem cell product that's not backed by meaningful evidence of safety and efficacy. Another major problem has to do with all of the misrepresentations that when you have businesses, uh, and the study to the right that I mentioned is one that recently came out um, that involves researchers here at UCI. It looks at online uh, seminars that these businesses use um, to kind of pull, pull patients in. It's very common to use misleading marketing claims. And what's so problematic about misrepresentations, uh, deception, is that you, you, know, you can't really have um, informed individuals, informed patients, able to provide consent in an informed, meaningful manner if they're being given misleading, uh, misleading information. You can't make, uh, you know, sensible benefit-risk decisions. You can't, you can't kind of weigh stem cell interventions against other kinds of interventions if you're being, being given misleading accounts. So I want to suggest that, you know, physical injuries are a problem or a concern in this marketplace, but so also are misrepresentations. There's also not just the circulation of misleading information, there's also the way in which that's done. And Paul Knopfler and others have pointed out that, that many of these businesses use extremely aggressive sales tactics, very aggressive kind of hardball marketing tactics uh, that are not just kind of thrown out there into the void, but they're targeting particular patient populations and taking advantage of individuals' hope, desperation, suffering, vulnerability. And so I think, again, it's not just the representations, it's who's being targeted, how they're being targeted, and the often very manipulative ways in which this takes place which I think means that many individuals, they can you know, put a lot of thought into these decisions, but a lot is being done to, to spin them to take advantage of their vulnerability. So again, this is another problematic aspect of marketing activity. This is something that's taking place uh, right now in the midst of the pandemic. And so some, I don't in any way mean to suggest that all businesses in this space are, have somehow pivoted during the pandemic and are marketing supposed treatments and immune boosters for, to treat uh, COVID-19. But you can certainly find this activity here in the United States. You can find it on the international scene as well. Uh, so I think this is something that, you know, this is a real problem in the midst of a pandemic uh, when you have products that are not evidence-based, they're not FDA approved. Um, could cause harm, are likely useless, uh, you know, are kind of out there circulating in the marketplace. Again, taking advantage of people's, you know, fears, anxieties associated with the pandemic. And of course, now, um, you know, there's more and more businesses that appear to be focusing on making claims about long COVID. There's going to be individuals who suffer, possibly suffer for years with the after effects of being infected with SARS-CoV-2. And, and there seem to be some businesses that without doing much or any legwork to develop any actual treatments are, are happy to claim that they've got something that will help and charge individuals thousands or tens of thousands of dollars for these products. Um, so a lot of the work in this area focuses on how misrepresentations can harm particular individuals, you know, by leading to them being deceived, taken advantage of, scammed. Um, but I think it's important to understand that, sure, I mean, if you have just a couple of businesses, then maybe we need to think only about the harms to particular individuals and the way in which those individuals can be deceived and preyed upon. But when you have, you, you know, around 1,500 businesses operating in this space, that's really a marketplace that's operating at scale. And I think it has this larger systemic effect in terms of damaging, harming public understanding of stem cell treatment, stem cell therapy is the current state of stem cell research, just because there's so much misinformation and disinformation circulating in this space. And it's not just about purported stem cell treatments themselves, it's also often you can find very dismissive accusatory rhetoric about the FDA, for example, about other regulatory bodies. So you have kind of like a multiplicity of moves, uh, you know, misrepresentations, mischaracterizations of stem cells in the current state of stem cell research, but also this kind of um, outpouring of accusatory claims about regulatory bodies, which, you know, of course, there's reasonable grounds for criticizing the FDA and other uh, important social institutions, but often what's being claimed goes far beyond any kind of meaningful claim that can be made. I think this kind of rampant, widespread circulation of misleading and inaccurate claims can cause problems for patients, for their loved ones, but also for larger publics. In other words, us, those, those of us participating in today's discussion, to make these meaningful distinctions among evidence-based stem cell therapies, products that there might be enough evidence to administer them in clinical trials, but they're not ready for prime time, they're not ready for the marketplace. And then, you know, what we might have characterized as just kind of outright stem cell pseudoscience or quackery where there's, you know, there's not anything like enough data to even move it into clinical trials involving human beings. 
it's very hard to kind of make those distinctions in any meaningful kind of way when there's just so much information being pumped out there on you know, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, company business websites themselves, and a whole host of other outlets. Um, I also think we need to think about this as a marketplace that it probably causes real harm to more credible forms of clinical research, stem cell research, yes, but also other kinds of clinical research, in part because we don't know exactly how many individuals are going into this marketplace, but with this many businesses, it's reasonable to think that it's a pretty sizable uh, number of individuals who are going to these facilities, and court records would suggest that is indeed the case. Uh, it's also, you know, if you have businesses that are marketing purported stem cell treatments and people think that they can get access today to a stem cell therapy, well, you know, if that's what's, what has been conveyed to you and you find that claim persuasive, you know, why, why would you enroll in a clinical trial where there's a page after page of risks being disclosed, for example, or perhaps you're informed that you might receive a placebo, you could be in an arm where you'll be administered a placebo or you'll undergo a sham procedure. It's not shocking that people will kind of pick the option of getting what they think is a stem cell therapy as opposed to participating in a trial where they may not get the product that they would like to get. Um, and, and that, you know, part of the information they're given spends a fair bit of time talking about the risks of participating in the studies. So this probably has an effect in terms of individuals being pulled away from clinical trials and just entering the direct consumer marketplace. And then, of course, for people who go to these businesses, they will end up typically being excluded from clinical trials. So even if they're later interested in uh, participating in a clinical trial, it's usually too late at that point. And this last point, you know, I don't think we really know about the broader effects of injuries to patients and scams and misleading claims, exactly how that affects public understanding of credible clinical research taking place with stem cells and stem cell products. But it's certainly possible to speculate that there's a, a effects of some kind and probably not particularly helpful effects. So I'm going to wrap today by just talking about uh, some of the responses to the marketplace that I've described and also to what I think of as some of the, you know, harms that flow from that marketplace. Part of the response has been uh, a number of organizations uh, that I mentioned, ISSCR, ISCT, other organizations that have, that have done what they could to try and help patients, to give them questions to think about or ways of identifying red flags, helpful tips to protect themselves in what's often a, a risky, uh, predatory, you know, concerning marketplace. So there are a number of books and guides out there that patients can turn to that I think I've been a participant in some of these processes and I think they have some value, but I think we also need to acknowledge their limitations. Not surprisingly, given some of the harms that I mentioned, injuries, people concluding that they've been scammed, taken advantage of, um, you know, misleading advertising, inadequate efforts to obtain informed consent. There are a growing number of civil lawsuits in this space where individuals who allege that they've been harmed in some way have, have ended up filing suit against these businesses. And these lawsuits can take a variety of forms. The complaints, uh, the accusations or allegations can take a number of different forms. There's also been a fair bit of act activity on the part of regulatory bodies. The FDA has been has done, I think, a, a good job in terms of uh, clarifying how it interprets and applies uh, laws and regulations in this space. There were a couple of guidance documents that were put out in 2017 that I think do a really nice job of explaining, you know, when FDA approval is required and when it's not required in this space. So this is a this is a work that I think is helpful for individuals and, and um, entities operating in this space. Um, I also think there was something problematic about those guidance documents, and that is that, it, that while offering this very helpful kind of clarifying exercise, they also created what, what's known as this period of enforcement discretion, where the FDA would focus on businesses that were posing obvious risks to individuals, but that it would also take a kind of a risk-based approach and not always issue warning letters or untitled letters or seek permanent injunctions, even if a business was, was violating federal regulations. Um, they would sometimes exercise discretion and, and take no action over this period and give businesses time to come into compliance to contact the FDA to see if they needed FDA approval to stop selling non-compliant products. I think having a period of time for, for businesses to hopefully come into compliance was a sensible, sensible move to make. I think making it in excess of three years it ends up, you know, when you actually study this marketplace over time, it looks as though this provided a window for most businesses instead of exiting because they were selling non-compliant products. Instead, it was this period of expansion where businesses poured into the marketplace. So the FDA, in my view, you know, both played an important role in clarifying how laws and regulations can be applied to the specific stem cell products, but also provided this kind of period of relative inactivity if there were there was some there were some of the three actions but fair degree of inactivity that seems to have played a role in allowing this marketplace to even further expand 
There have been some efforts on the, by the FDA. There's a permanent injunction that was issued in Florida. There's another case where the FDA is seeking, seeking a permanent injunction in federal court here in California uh, against not just the businesses, but entire chain of businesses that originated here in California. There have been many other warning letters and untitled letters. So I think to give credit to the FDA, they have stepped up their enforcement activities. They're stating that they in, intend to continue. Uh, exercising, exercising uh, kind of you know greater role in this marketplace in future. I think the jury's out. We will see if and when that happens, but hopefully it does. There's been activity on the part of the Federal Trade Commission, focusing in particular on deceptive and misleading advertising. The business mentioned to the left in the press release there was uh, uh, some a physician here in California who ran two businesses. The one to right to the right is an ongoing case where the FTC has partnered with the Attorney General in Georgia. Uh, to focus on uh, launching a complaint against a business and chain again uh, there in Georgia. Um, there's an attorney general in New York, uh, Letitia James, who successfully secured a $5.1 million court judgment against Park Avenue Stem Cell, a business operating in New York. Um, don't mention in this slide, but there are a number of other state attorney general's offices uh, that have um, legal actions taking place, um, Arkansas, Iowa, Nebraska, those are some of the more visible ones right now that, that are taking action against clinics in those states. So this is where we're having an increase in, in state level activity against businesses that are using deceptive advertising. And I think that's a meaningful response to misleading activity, misrepresentations. Occasionally doctors will end up having, uh, they'll be disciplined or experience license revocation as in this case, as in Greco's in Florida. Um, so that's one way of responding to these businesses. State legislatures have also been operating, kind of responding to this marketplace. California was the first uh, that it required uh, licensed healthcare practitioners in, in this state uh, to, to disclose to patients, prospective patients, if a product was not FDA approved, that had to be disclosed. There were fines that could be issued to other states. Washington and Vermont, for example, have also passed state legislation responding to this marketplace. I think there's more that can be done here, and some states are exploring uh, bills that they may pass. Uh, one point that I would make is that this is a, uh, you know, it's a large scale marketplace. There are, there's a lot of activity and I think any meaningful regulatory response can't just come from any one agency. It can't come from any one public institution. There are a number of organizations that have important roles to play in responding to this marketplace. The FDA, yes, but also the, the FTC, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, if you were criminal charges were to be um, filed in more instances, I think that might empty out the pool. The SEC, sometimes deception and misrepresentation affects investors, and they tend to get involved in that space for publicly traded companies, for example. Uh, there's a role, I think, for state medical boards, legislatures, state attorney general's offices to play, a greater role for them to play. And I've highlighted universities and academic medical centers just to suggest that I think there are a number of things those of us at academic institutions can do. You know, one is to try and address misrepresentations, misinformation, disinformation in the stem cell space, in other spaces but also to hopefully demand uh, you know, robust standards applied to individuals at our own institutions and to be very cautious uh, that, we'll, that if we're offering something that's not evidence-based, it's being provided in the context of a well-designed, properly conducted clinical trial and not just pitched or peddled as a, as a purported treatment if the data don't, don't support marketing claims of that sort. And as you can see, I think there are a number of other uh, entities that have an important role to play in this space. I'm going to wrap, I'm often asked by individuals, you know, what they can do, what kind of questions should they ask? And I'm much more interested in what I think of as more structural resp responses or more systemic responses that are not just about trying to, you know, spot red flags. Um, but I do think since so many individuals are aware of this marketplace and may think, think of it as a place to turn to if they are ill or they have a family member who's ill, uh, so just to sort of throw out a few concluding questions for individuals to think about, I'm not going to go through them all right now, but I'm just going to list them here, uh, you know, for individuals to think about that if they decide that they might go to a clinic that's marketing a purported stem cell treatment, there are some questions that might be worth thinking through. I wouldn't suggest this is a decision to be made casually. Um, I, I think it's something where people really want to do their homework. And I think often uh, a stance of real caution is, is warranted both to not be taken advantage of from a financial perspective, but also not to be administered a product that is advertised as, as likely to help someone and then in, ends up uh, potentially causing harm. So I'm going to stop here. Um, thank you very much for today's, uh, for participating in today's conversation. And if there's questions, comments, observations, I look forward to hearing from you. Wow, Lee, that was, 
absolutely a fantastic talk. And you will not have been able to follow this, but there have been just a flurry of questions running on the side that a number of us um, have been trying to answer and keep up with. In that vein, though, um, while I absolutely invite people to add questions to the Q&A, and I'll continue to monitor that um, on the side as we're having a quick talk, I want to bring out and highlight a couple of the things that came up in case everyone has not been um, necessarily following that and sort of get your take on a couple of things. So, so one question that was asked is, um, since clinicaltrials.gov is set up as, as a registry, right, where all trials are listed there, why is that the case? Is there any way to be able to discern things on clinicaltrials.gov that are FDA authorized from not, you know, sort of the chalk from the cheese? Jeff Lomax from CIRM actually chimed in and raised something up that I had forgotten about, but I want to raise it for the audience so that people are aware. There actually is a tick box on that site if you go to it where you can limit your search to show you only FDA authorized trials. And so I want to highlight that for, for everyone as a, a resource in terms of things to do. That said, why, what is the value of having a registry like clinicaltrials.gov to begin with, in your view, Lee? Is there value to having it in its current form, or should there be attempt, an attempt to revisit and to sort of moderate that, especially when it comes to things like stem cell and regenerative medicine trials? Sure. Um, so, no, I haven't seen any of these questions, and so I appreciate you kind of you know, walking me through the first one. Um, you know, I think registries, databases, and clinical trials are valuable, and I think making them available so that you know any of us can go online and do searches. I think I think they are potentially useful tools, um, and and you know many of us who work in in health sciences areas may have gone on for a family member or friend. I've had that experience of trying to see if there's something out there that might be relevant for someone. Um, so I think it's helpful for patients. I hope I think it's helpful for academics. I think many parties can benefit from having access to, to data sets of that kind. The problem is that, that you know, in, in the case of clinicaltrials.gov, for example, I mean, this is something that's managed by the NIH. I think for many individuals, it looks like this credible source. And of course, there are many well-designed, you know, properly reviewed clinical trials that are there, but there are also junk studies that have been put on there that there are all kinds of problems with the research methods. When people call, they end up finding out they're being charged. So it's not really a credible trial. It's more like a, a marketing transaction package to look like a clinical study. Now, you know, the NIH has taken one step, which is to make a disclaimer much more visible than it used to be. So when you look at that site now, you do see that the NIH makes it clear that this is not information that's been carefully vetted by the NIH. It's not been approved by the NIH. It's sort of, it's there, but buyer beware. And I think the question is, is that enough? I think it's meaningful to have a disclaimer, but I don't think it's enough. And so, you know, in the world of peer-reviewed academic research, we do have something known as a retraction, where if there are problems with a study, if it's fraudulent, for example, if the data is made up, you know, we do pull some studies from the scientific literature. It's not a casual thing. It's not a quick thing, but that's an opportunity. It's, it's a mechanism that can be used to remove problematic studies from the scientific literature. And maybe we need to think about something like that for clinicaltrials.gov, that we need to have... Uh, some steps in place to make sure that that we're being careful when we allow studies to be made publicly available, that you can't just kind of like check a box, don't need FDA approval, and there you go, it's up there, if, if in fact that's wrong. Um, so I think there need to be better mechanisms to screen on the front end. And then when errors get made, there need to be some mechanisms to pull those studies out of the database. And there may be some where it's kind of hard to know, is it maybe not as well designed as it should have been, but it's not really predatory. It's not meant to take advantage of people. There's maybe just some limitations with the method. And there are others I think that are much clearer cut. I mean, you know, US stem cell, for example, it gets a permanent injunction. There's an awful lot that takes place there, but I think you can still see US stem cell clinical studies listed in that database. So I think we need to change, think, change how we think about that database and we need to understand that it has public value and to maintain public value, it needs better curation. Yep, I, I think that's exactly right. And that's kind of the discussion that was, was rolling on the side um, when it came to that. Um, I, another question that was raised early on, and please, I really do encourage people, I know we're answering questions on the side, but um, if you have additional questions, anyone in the audience, don't hesitate to type them in. Um, I know that Dr. Turner is glad to take your questions and answer them, although I have to say, Lee, you gave a really clear and compelling presentation. So um, I think that um, makes it easy for people to get a handle, handle on um you know, the, the sort of global issues that you're raising. So one question that came up early on that I would highlight back for the rest of the audience is now 
we're you know 20 years some like into CERM right for for where we we stand in terms of funding stem cell and regenerative medicine research and the amount of ramp up time um notwithstanding to what it takes to move through to translational research here we are at this phase we have a, a bunch of things that are phase one and phase two not just CERM funded but across the board in terms of stem cells and regenerative medicine very few things that have progressed through to phase three um, so I gave my answer online to that, but from your perspective, what would you say to that? Why, why is that? And I know you and I have talked, there are a lot of complex reasons that are buried in there, but um, pick a couple maybe, because I think this audience would be interested. Sure, I mean, I, I think part of it is that it is difficult. It's costly, it's time consuming, it's labor intensive developing safe and efficacious therapies. And that's true of stem cell products, but it's true of small molecule drugs as well. I mean, it's just, when we're talking about coming up with, you know, credible, safe, effective therapies for Parkinson's disease, for MS, this is not something that takes place in a compressed period of time. There are setbacks along the way. There are studies that throw up conflicting findings. Some studies that you know provide sort of strong signals of efficacy, and then someone else does a study, and and um, you know maybe the study design is a bit different, or maybe they're using a different stem cell product or some other investigational product, and and the results aren't as encouraging. So I think part of it is that you know. Clinical research, scientific research in general, often takes place in a very incremental kind of way. And so if we think that we can pour money into addressing a problem like a particular disease and we're going to have stem cell therapies or something other kind of therapy emerging in two to three years, we've got the timeline wrong. In most instances, it's going to be a more gradual and incremental process. And it's not shocking during that time that some people will go online and be pulled in by these kinds of claims. But you know, often these are businesses that aren't going through that careful product process and people can end up being badly harmed. But there's been, you know, a number of good studies in this area that point to kind of stem cell researchers themselves and other researchers will often underestimate how much time it will take to move from preclinical research to clinical research. And, and then patients too often underestimate the current state of stem cell research or how much time it's going to take for products to enter the marketplace. And I think that's something that, you know, when it comes to having fundraising activity of any kind, whether it's here in California or elsewhere, it's this very difficult act of you know, sort of talking about the encouraging optimistic side of stem cell research, that there could be, you know, credible evidence-based therapies that emerge, but also helping people understand that this is not a straightforward exercise. It's not a slam dunk. There's going to be sometimes investments with not much of a return. There's going to be others where it takes time. I think that message is, it's, it's not as uh, enticing as just sort of this assurance of quick therapies. And, and if you're seriously ill, have faced with a life-threatening message, an illness, of course it's not the message that you wanna hear, but I think a kind of recalibration of expectations is important. Uh, the you know, stem cell researchers are under a lot of pressure to get funding. And so that kind of, you know, I mentioned before that I think hype, stem cell hype, it's not just you know, journalists, it's not just newspapers, academics themselves, we are kind of under pressure, we're under, incentives and disincentives and constraints. And so I think we have to, again, understand that there can be harmful unintended consequences. You know, we need to be very careful when we're publicizing data and not feed into uh, hyperbole and, and misunderstandings. So just to say that, uh, you know, I think there, there's a lot going on there, um, but in general, we, I think we sort of uh, underestimate how, how difficult it is and how much time it takes to come up with effective products. Yeah, I, I think that's really a, um, an outstanding answer, Lee. And, and I would maybe just expound on that one step and, and add in this calibration of timelines that, that you raise as being a fundamental issue, which I, I think is really critical. Something that often doesn't get brought out and or thought about is there's oftentimes technology development or endpoint measures that need to be happening in parallel, right? So the field that I work in, spinal cord injury, is a great example of this because it was such a cut and dried, if you have this level of injury, you are never going to get function back kind of game for so many years. We, When clinical trials first started ongoing for spinal cord injury, not even in regenerative medicine and stem cells, but just in the early days of looking for ways to promote regeneration and repair, the endpoint measures to how for how to quantitatively and reliably assess did something make someone better right did they have improved sensory function or motor function and was that a meaningful level of function such that it would justify a next stage clinical trial or potentially a biological license right a biologics license from the fda 
those things weren't even there. Those all had to be developed um, from scratch. And it wasn't until we got to the point of moving to clinical trials that that gap really became apparent. And I think in terms of neurological disease and neurological disease progression, where the timelines also get really long, some of these studies take not, you know, a year or 18 months to complete, but five years or 10 years, they become very longitudinal in terms of being able to make a real assessment. And that's hard for us to sit with because of course we all want things to move faster than the way that is. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a, a question that, that just um, came in from the audience um, that kind of, it gets to the, the heart of some of these issues and, and it really, I'm gonna broad, phrase it broadly, it is about mechanism. When we talk about administering cell therapeutic cell populations, one way that they can have an action is a direct effect. You know, you put them in and you make a replacement cell, for example. Um, The question here that's raised is, um, can there also be paracrine effects, right? And, And especially when we're thinking about some of the types of clinics that you've highlighted today, I mean, I think we know there's not long term engraftment of those cells that we're sort of relying in terms of any chance of feasibility for bone marrow transplants to or uh, infusions, intrathecal infusions for spinal cord injury, whatnot, to be having some sort of paracrine effect. And I think that's confusing for people, that idea of what these cells might be doing. And it, it certainly is complicated in terms of what we look at our endpoints of assessment. So what are your thoughts on that? I just threw you a really wild curveball, right? Like a wide question, but Sure. No, I'm, I'm glad you asked. I mean, it's, you're right. It, it may be that a kind of a, st- a stock way of thinking about stem cells is that they're going to, you know, sort of the usual language of, you know, regenerate tissue, repair tissue, restore tissue, cells are going to engraft. And that is one way of thinking about stem cells and stem cell treatments. But, you know, as you mentioned, there's also uh, paracrine effects. There's, it's important to think about stem cells as not just potentially engrafting, but also, uh, you know, the language of stem cells being kind of medicinal in their own right, being sort of therapeutic in their own right. And, and so that is part of the stem cell research that needs to take place. But that's also something where it is possible to design clinical trials to have endpoints, for example, where you conduct clinical trials where you attempt to measure those effects. But there is a difference between, you know, trying to do that in a mechanistic kind of way, doing it in a very rigorous way in both you know, the, the preclinical and the clinical space, thinking very carefully about what your endpoints ought to be, starting with preclinical research, moving into clinical research. You know, that's another important research program, I guess, there's, but I'm, I'm trying to emphasize there is this difference between kind of like taking those steps, doing in the clinical trial context, doing with all the thought that you mentioned going into, you know, clinical trial design, selecting endpoints, uh, looking very carefully at the data that you're generating, thinking very carefully about how it's to be interpreted, and just kind of assuming that, well, we know already that stem cells have that effect, and we know that they'll relieve pain, for example, or we know that they'll reduce inflammation as though all of the really challenging questions have somehow already been answered. And so it's okay to enter this marketplace. It's okay to kind of make these claims. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's premature to make those kinds of strong form claims. But I also think that that is, you know, one paradigm that ought to be evaluated in, in a clinical trials context and is being evaluated. Yep. It is being evaluated. That's right. And, and I think um, it raises to me as a basic scientist kind of a side issue in that we need to in so much as we can try and understand mechanism because it tells us when we have an active product. And we've had even in, you know, for mesenchymal cells as an example, things that have done well in a phase one and phase two and some spectacular failures in phase threes. And much of that, in my opinion, has boiled down to not understanding what the mechanism was and what product you needed to have as you went through scale up to move into a larger clinical trial to really, be in a position to expect that you might have efficacy there. And so it just adds to these layers of complexity that we need to think about in terms of stem cells and and regenerative medicine. Dipping back into an earlier question again that Sid actually asked, um, but I think there was this side discussion on it and I don't know that most of our audience will have caught it. So I'm I'm gonna bring it out for you and, and give you a chance to chat about it a minute. And Sid's point was that going way back to the 70s, um, he gave the example of an unproven, unapproved drug called Latril, which became a popular alternative to conventional ca- cancer therapy. I expect that you would know about this. I didn't necessarily know this example. Um, was apparently very controversial at the time. And um, 
over time, his point is that advocacy for and use of Latril faded away, perhaps because cancer is a difficult thing to treat, perhaps because, um, you know, as a sort of placebo, it didn't have lasting effects, perhaps because um, new things, you know, came along and, and came on the market, real clinical trials t took over and started to make progress. The question Sid asks buried in all of that is, do you think that's where unlicensed, you know, the, this kind of clinical space on, on direct consumer marketing for stem cell and regenerative medicine, do you think that will happen there over time as we start to move through to an increased number of phase three clinical trials and, you know, potentially things that achieve biologics licenses from the, the FDA? Will this controversy gradually fade? Or is it always going to be riding right alongside us as we go through this process of moving from bench to bedside? Uh, there's a lot in there. I mean, I, so I am familiar with Laetrelle. It was and, a question and, uh, from it, Sid, so there you go. Sure, <laughs> sure. So, I mean, California was was an important place in terms of, you know, clinics popping up, uh, marketing Laetrelle, providing access, um, you know, fights over gaining access to it. Um, yeah, there was this time, I mean, I think Steve McQueen, the famous actor, as I recall, when he had cancer, I think that was an intervention he pursued. Um, but I mean, sure, I mean, people would go to clinics here in the United States. Uh, when it became more difficult to obtain access in the United States, there were a lot of border clinics in Mexico that, that Americans then traveled to. And it hasn't entirely disappeared. I mean, you can still find occasional references to Laetrile. And, and uh, in fact, I think there was someone who recently had criminal charges brought against them, and they were selling a, a kind of a a Laotrail product or a Laotrail analog analogous kind of product just within the last year or two. Uh, so it has not entirely disappeared from, from mainstream discourse. But I mean, I think about there's some interesting parallels and, and interesting differences. But what I mean, you know, one difference that I think of is I think of Laotrail as something that, you know, it never really was evidence-based. There never was meaningful evidence kind of behind it. It was all kind of about anecdote and testimonials and I do think of that as being different in some significant ways from stem cell therapies insofar as there actually are meaningful stem cell products. And, and so I, I think of what, you know, sort of stem cells, it's going to be a bit difficult. I actually think that we may be entering a much more difficult, challenging space where, for example, you know, there may, maybe there's going to be some stem cell products that come to market. They have safety data behind them. They have good efficacy data behind them. They end up being FDA approved. And it becomes sort of ever more difficult to tease apart, you know, what are the FDA approved evidence-based interventions and what are the ones where there's a lot of hype around them, but they're not FDA approved, they're not backed by evidence. It may become more difficult rather than easier to sort of make these distinctions. Something else I should add is that, you know, when I talk about the direct consumer marketplace, there, you know, there are some academic medical centers that are now particip participants in this space, mostly in the ortho space and some physical medicine and sports medicine. I'm concerned about the evidence space that kind of, you know, backstops those kinds of marketing claims. But I think that's going to kind of muddy the waters as well when you have some academic medical centers that, again, they may be operating with problematic evidence base, but they're operating in this direct space, but they're all, they're bringing with them the legitimacy and credibility of academic medical centers. So I think that's going to complicate things a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there's going to be a lot of challenges. And then there's, you know, I think we don't actually yet know in terms of what's coming next when it comes to this marketplace. You know, Laetrile, there was basically a strong federal reaction and those clinics got shut down and some people have criminal charges brought against them. Well, we know some of that is happening in this marketplace. You know, there is someone who had criminal charges brought against them for marketing for COVID, COVID treatments. They're, there seems to be a ramping up of activity on the part of uh, law enforcement agencies and regulatory bodies. But still, there is this question of, are we going to see this marketplace shrink over time as state legislators, as state agencies, as the federal agencies kind of get more involved? Are we going, have, have, we, have we kind of reached peak, peak marketplace and we're heading down? Or are we going to see, yeah, there's going to be an uptick in regulatory activity, but the marketplace is going to continue to expand. So I, I think the jury's out in terms of where all of this goes. So again, I would say that kind of adds to the uncertainty that we know we can look back with hindsight and see that Laetrile kind of fades away, not just of its own accord, but also because of regulatory action, regulatory responses. I don't think we know yet how this story ends. I wouldn't be shocked if five years we can kind of talk about the enforcement actions the FDA has taken, the... Uh, acts, acts taken by the FDC and states attorney generals, but there's still this out of control marketplace that's out there that people kind of turn to. That's a possibility. I don't think we should um, 
bury our head in the sands and think this marketplace is somehow about to fade away in the next year or two. So I guess I have um, just maybe in our discussion and then we'll probably, unless I see a, another question come in, um, I have maybe two follow-ups to that. One, one is, because you just made me think about it right now, do you think we could end up in a situation, as much as we think about the FDA and federal regulation, where we have regional pockets that are sort of state driven in terms of what this looks like because it you know some sort of exception gets carved out I'm, I'm thinking of Texas for example right so do you have any comments mm -hmm. on on that because I think that is going to um, make a confusing situation for many people that much more confusing right and kind of perpetuate um, this proliferation of, of unregulated alternatives mm -hmm. Um, I do think that's a possibility. I mean, we may start to see, you know, when you when you look at activity of businesses and clinics, you know, part of that is it's tied to population, population size. There's a lot of people who live in California, Florida, and Texas. So I mean, it's it's a large marketplace, but it's not just a study of a population. And when we think when we think about well, what are some of the other factors that might lead these kind of regional markets to expand or contract. Well, when it comes to the contraction side of things, you know, if there's changes in legislation, if there's robust state-based legislation, uh, that is passed, you know, not just not just you have to disclose that you're selling an, an non-FDA approved product, but maybe, you know, you need to contact the FDA, you need to confirm that you can market this product, uh, consumer protections, you know, there are a variety of steps that might make it more difficult for these businesses to operate. State medical boards could, some state medical boards could choose to invest more resources, dedicate more investigators to targeting these businesses, and, you know, end up revoking the licenses of licensed healthcare practitioners. And I, I would think that you probably don't need to, you know, have an awful lot of license revocations to make people start to think this is not the best space to be operating in. So it is possible to, ima to imagine some states going that route and saying, you know, there are consumer protection issues, there's possibility of elder abuse, there's poss the possibility of, you know, fraud and financial scams, and this is a bad thing. We don't want our citizens to be dealing with this. They take action. And then there could be other states that are more, well, we're, we're trying to promote a bioeconomy, and we think this is really encouraging, and we promote small businesses, and we're going to pass legislation that promotes you know, right to try, right to choose these products, health freedom, okay. medical freedom. And we're going to be a space where you can, unless the feds do something, you're probably not going to be bothered by the local state medical board and you're not going to be bothered by the local state attorney general. And then we could start to see this kind of polarizing, pulling apart kind of effect. And, um, and who knows? I mean, you know, maybe we're seeing the effects of some of this already, like California, for example. I mean, there's that state legislation that's been passed, but but um, anybody who follows the Los Angeles Times knows that there's been these trenchant critiques of the medical board in California for many years, and and maybe problems with how that medical board has operated has played a role in contributing to the size of this marketplace here in California. So maybe we're already seeing some of those effects, and if there's a different structure, it will end up having different effects. So I do think that's feasible, and maybe that's what we're yeah. going to see. States, so then, states um, attorneys generals. Sorry, yeah. I was just going to say, you know, the, the, the development by, by the involvement of attorney generals' offices at the state level in this space. I mean, I think that it's not, we need to think not just about state medical boards, but about those AGO offices and the way in which they can use state legislation around, you know, deception, fraud, misrepresentation. That, I think, could play quite an effective turn, and, and maybe we're going to see that having, a, having an effect in this space. Sorry, I interrupted you. Yep, no, a, a, absolutely. Um, the linked thing I wanted to just bring out um, in this thread is um, uh, a question that was um, raised by Rick Robertson about what the role is for professional societies in terms of trying to set at least some context to this, right? And influence the narrative. And I wanted to ask that of you particularly because of your role in the International Society for Stem Cell Research and how ISSCR has tried to tackle, you know, some guidelines and, and a thoughtful um, uh, um, set of, you know, suggestions and, and strictures and, 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 you know, road lines for, for people to stay within. So really it's an invitation for a comment about, you know, what the role of something like ISSCR is and, and what your role has been there. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, ISSCR is definitely, the International Society for Stem Cell Research is definitely an important organization to mention in this context. There are many others. I mean, International Society for Cell and Gene Therapy, I've been involved in some of their efforts as well. 
Same thing in other countries. I mean, Canada has a stem cell network and they've tried to, to do some work focusing on patient education, patient awareness, um, you know, kind of addressing this topic in particular in Australia, at Stem Cells Australia. So I think a number of, of scientific societies, professional societies, in some cases, it's funding bodies, have tried to do a lot in terms of, uh, you know, not just giving people a sense of what kind of questions to ask for anyone thinking about going into this marketplace and, and what kind of red flags to look for, but also helping people understand, you know, what, what is a clinical trial? What's a stem cell? What does it mean to develop a stem cell product and go through the phases of you know, preclinical research and clinical research? Why, why do we do that? Why don't we just let businesses make advertising claims? I think all that is really quite valuable. And I think a number of organizations for many years now have done a lot in this space to not just, you know, not just kind of engage in patient education, but to, I mean, reach out to patients, to work with patients, to reach, to reach out to family members of patients and disease advocacy groups and work on these documents together and try and address these kinds of issues. And also sometimes, you know, reaching out to regulatory bodies and pointing, whether it's the FDA or Health Canada or other entities to say, look, you know, here, here's how current legislation is, is being, you know, here's a potential gap, or here are how some businesses that appear to be taking advantage of legislation. Here's how you might revise your documents. So it's not just kind of communicating with patients, but it's also engaging with, with you know, regulators, legislators. I think these are all valuable steps. There are a lot that these organizations can do, but I also think we need to understand that often they have fairly finite resources. So, I mean, ISSCR, for example, tried to sort of engage in naming and shaming some of these businesses and, and ended up kind of stepping back from that because they became, I think, you know, sort of fearful of litigation and having to deal with legal threats from these businesses. So they have to be careful about what they do. And also we need to understand, I mean, you know, they're not regulators. And so they may be aware of businesses that are kind of damaging the field of stem cell research. Maybe as someone inside those organizations can contact the FDA or other regulatory bodies, but they don't have any kind of powers of enforcement themselves. So I think they play an important role on the public engagement front, uh, the education front, holding events, whether it's like this or other kinds of events, they do a lot in that space. Um, but, you know, there are some constraints on what they do. And then the other bigger problem is that, you know, when I've been involved in these activities, often what it, it starts off with is we're going to prepare a document and that's going to be a PDF that will get posted to a website. And maybe that will get transformed into a Q&A that will be a little bit more accessible, all of which is valuable, I think, but it also has its limitations because while an organization is going through that process of thinking about well, what kind of questions are get asked and how do we answer those questions in a meaningful evidence base way. Meaning, meanwhile, there's, you know, sort of this incredible number of businesses that are pumping out a very different kind of narrative on social media platforms, on their business websites. You know, they've got Twitter, they've got YouTube, they've got Facebook, and some of what they put out may be accurate. There may be disinformation, there may be misinformation, but it's happening. It's like a fire hose. And it's very difficult to compete with that. And so I think that's something that we need to understand is that scientific societies, professional societies, they have a difficult time capturing eyeballs when there's, a, there's this marketplace that has tremendous resources to kind of put out very different accounts and narratives. So that's really a challenge they face. So I appreciate what they do. I've tried to be a part of it in some, you know, sort of modest way contributing to their efforts. Um, but they're often outmatched and mismatched by the businesses they're trying to counter and the often sizable financial resources those businesses have to basically continue operating in this space. Yep. I think that's um, a great summary. I do, we're, we're um, at 8.25 now. So while we still have a few questions out there, I, I think it's probably time um, to make a wrap for the evening. And um, Lee, I just want to um, thank you for your time and for your thoughtful comments. Thank everyone who took the time to join us tonight. I am um, really so sorry that we are not gonna be able to have our in-person um, annual evening lecture this month. It was heartbreaking for us to have to cancel that, but do keep an eye out because we very much want to have the opportunity to reschedule that and, and be in person. I was so excited. We had um, almost 400 registrants to be in person. So it really just broke our hearts to, to have to put that off, but hopefully we'll be able to come together again and um, look for us as we continue on with this series one way or another. And everyone, please join me in thanking Lee. And Lee, I'll see you next week. Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you very much. Really appreciate having the chance to participate today.